Welcome back to the Physics Bible. In this video we're going to look at CP2, which is the forces and motion topic of the Edexcel Physics GCSE. This first page is all about force diagrams. In a force diagram we use an arrow to represent the size of the force but also the direction, because remember, as we discussed in the last video, a vector, such as a force, needs a size and a direction. The first question says, add an arrow to the diagrams above so that the forces on the objects are balanced. So balanced forces are where the sum, or the addition, of more than one force gives a total force of zero. To make this happen, if there's more than one force, the forces need to be in opposite directions and the same size. So, seeing that I've given you quite a big hint there, have a go at these first two diagrams. We want the forces on those objects to be balanced. Okay. So this first one, we have five newtons to the left. So very simply, I draw an arrow which is very close to the same size as the other arrow. The size of the arrow does matter, and I've labeled it five newtons. So five newtons to the right and five newtons to the left is what we would call balanced forces, which means here we have 10 newtons up to balance the 10 newtons down. Now these were separate parts of the question so don't be worried if you think well why is that one bigger than that one. It doesn't matter just as long as on the object you're talking about you follow um, the scale that they've used on the arrows on that diagram. So here that size arrow represents 10 newtons but on this diagram that size arrow represents 5 newtons. The next question Calculate the resultant force. Now, the word resultant means overall. Now, we get a resultant force if there's one or more forces acting on an object. And simply put, if the forces aren't balanced, then there must be a resultant force. Here we've got seven newtons to the right, and there's three newtons to the left. They're not balanced because they're not gonna cancel each other out. So we want to know the resultant force, which is the overall force. So what do you think that could be? Well, to get the number, we would simply take the biggest number and take away the smaller number. So the resultant force on this object is seven minus three, which is four newtons. Now we're not done because remember a force needs a direction. So which direction are those four newtons acting? To the left or to the right? Because the bigger force was on the right, then the resultant force will be in the same direction as the bigger force. So our final answer is four newtons to the right. Next, what is the resultant force on this box? We've got four newtons down, four newtons up, 2 newtons to the right and 5 newtons to the left. Have a think about it, have a go yourself. Well, the 4 newtons down and 4 newtons up are actually balanced. So they give a resultant force in the up and down direction of 0. So we can forget about the box moving upwards or downwards. But the one on the left is much bigger than the one on the right. We've got five newtons and two newtons. So the resultant force, they're gonna cancel, so we're gonna forget about those. And five minus two gives us three newtons. And remember, we need to mention the direction, which is to the left, three newtons to the left. Okay, next we have table 
Um, now, what we're being asked is, given the force diagram, what's going to happen next to the object? So, as if a pause button had been pressed, and in this first one, if I do this as an example, and then you can have a go at the second and third one. In this first one, the starting velocity of the object is stationary. So this object, we're going to say, is not moving at the minute. But remember, the pause button has been pressed. So let's look at the forces acting on it from the force diagram. Two newtons up, two newtons down. They're balanced, so we know there's going to be no change of speed upwards or downwards. But there is five newtons acting to the right. This means that there's going to be a resultant force to the right. Now, if an object has a resultant force, then it will change speed. If it's stationary and the resultant force is acting to the right, then we say the object will accelerate to the right. If the forces are balanced, then the object will stay at the same speed. Now if it's stationary, that means that it will stay stationary. If it's moving left or moving right, then it will keep moving in that direction at the same speed. The last example, if there's a resultant force acting in the opposite direction to the direction that the object's moving, then instead of causing an acceleration, it's actually going to cause a deceleration. It will cause the object to slow down. So have a look at the starting velocities of object 2 and object 3. We've done one. And tell me what you think is going to happen next. As if we had a pause button pressed and then press play. Okay. Well, it tells us that it's moving to the left, and I look at the force diagram, and actually the forces are balanced. So there's going to be no changing speed. So I know it's going to keep moving to the left at a constant speed. So when talking about um, resultant forces, we're usually going to either talk about an acceleration, um, a constant speed, or this last one is an example of a deceleration. The object's moving to the right, but there's a resultant force acting backwards on it, and so that's actually going to slow the object down. So I would say It's going to decelerate, it's going to slow down. If that object was moving to the right and then decelerated, it could decelerate all the way back to zero. It could become stationary. If that two newtons continued to act to the left, then we'd actually see an acceleration to the left. So this deceleration caused by the two newtons is only a deceleration because it's moving to the right. If this object was stationary to start with, then it would actually, the answer would be accelerate left. Okay, question number 12. Here we've been given the equation weight equals mass times gravity. The first question is gravity on Earth is 10 newtons per kilogram. What is the weight of Mr. Percy if he's 70 kilograms? So <clears throat> we look at the numbers and I can write next to that G because that's the number for gravity and 70 kilograms is a mass so I'm going to write M there. And it's asking me, what is the weight of Mr. Percy? So this equation, I don't have to do anything with. I can simply say weight equals mass, 70, multiplied by gravity, which is 10, which gives us 700. And the unit for weight 
Well, weights are force, so it's newtons. Next one. If Mr. Percy went to Titan, gravity is 1.4 newtons per kilogram. What's his new weight? Remember that you can pause the video at any time, have a go at the question yourself. The answer to this is we simply replace 10 with 1.4 because the gravity is going to be different but we're expected to know that the mass of something or someone is always constant. So if I went to Titan then I would still have a mass of 70 kilograms but we've got a new value for gravity. So W equals mass is still 70 but this time we times by 1.4. Now, you can do it in your head, it's obviously going to be 98, but we should use a calculator. We don't want to make any mistakes in the exam. 98. And the unit says Newtons again. So look, on Earth, I have a downwards force of 700 Newtons, but on the moon Titan, I actually only have a downwards force of 98 Newtons. Now, that's not to say that I can claim that I've lost weight in the sense that we say on, on Earth. What we, on Earth, when we lose weight, what we really mean is we've lost mass. Another way to actually lose weight, technically, would be to go somewhere where the gravity is less because we would have a downwards force of less. Next question. Explain why Mr. Percy can jump higher on Titan than Earth. Now this is an explain question. In an explain question, we're looking for some physics um, reasoning behind our answer. We need to actually say why something's happened. So we would normally use the word because in the answer. So why can I jump higher on Titan than Earth? I'll give you a clue. Think back to what we were talking about with resultant forces and think about the forces acting when Mr. Percy jumps. Okay, so we can explain this by thinking about Mr. Percy on Earth. Seven hundred newtons acting down on him. When I jump, I'm applying a force from the muscles from my legs. So to accelerate upwards, I would have to produce a force that's bigger than 700 newtons. So let's keep it easy and say that I apply a force of 1,000 newtons upwards. So the 1,000 newtons is from my legs pushing up on me, and the 700 newtons is my weight down. And we can see there that the resultant force is 300 newtons up. And that's going to cause me to speed up in the upwards direction, known as a jump. However, on Titan, if I try and jump with the same force upwards, 1000 newtons, assuming that my muscles still work, my weight down is only 98. And so the resultant force this time would be 902 newtons up. Now that's a much bigger resultant force and that would cause me to jump much quicker and obviously that would lead to me jumping higher on the moon. If Mr. Law has a weight of 140 newtons on Titan, what is his mass? Now, again, we've got some numbers, so we're going to put letters next to them. We've got 140 newtons. Now, that's telling me actually his weight, so I'm going to write W there. It says that we're on Titan. Now I'm going to have to use this equation again. So be aware that questions can sometimes include information from earlier parts in the question. And here we're going to have to use that number 1.4 um, as the gravity on Titan again. So I'm going to write that in there. G in this question is 1.4 because we're on Titan. It's asking me to calculate mass. So this equation needs rearranged. Remember, if the two are multiplied together, then what happens 
to the one that you don't want is G. I need to move it to the other side and it's going to go underneath the W. So we get mass equals weight divided by gravity. The weight is 140 newtons and gravity is 1.4. Use a calculator if you have to, but we should be able to see that that gives us exactly 100 kilograms. So that means that someone who's 30 kilograms heavier than Mr. Percy, actually 140 newtons on Titan means that they're still five times lighter than Mr. Percy on Earth. Next set of questions is based around uh, Newton's second law, which states that if we have a resultant force, I'm actually going to write resultant there, because when we use this equation, we're always talking about a resultant force. Remember, if there isn't a resultant force, then you're not going to get an acceleration. So once we know the resultant force, we put it in there, if we know the mass of the object, we've got mass there, and we'd be able to work out how quickly something speeds up. In this first question, Mr. Percy sits in a trolley which has a mass of 20 kilograms. So we've got M, Mr. Percy is 70 kilograms. Oh, wait a minute, that's M as well. What force is required to accelerate him in the trolley at 5 meters per second squared. So that's A. It's asking me what force is required. So I can use this equation and I don't have to change it around because I'm trying to work out the force that's needed or the resultant force that's needed to make this happen. Now, because I'm in the trolley, to speed up me and the trolley, we're gonna to have to add the two masses together. So the total mass is 90 kilograms, and the acceleration, we're told, is five meters per second. And so, to speed us up at a rate of five meters per second, whilst I'm in a trolley, we're gonna need a force of 450 newtons. Calculate the acceleration of the following object. We're starting to combine a couple of things that we've already been through now. The first step is to calculate the resultant force. The second step is to then use the equation to find the acceleration. So have a go yourself, and we'll go through it in a second. Okay. So the resultant force on the object is 150 minus 50, which is 100 newtons. So that's the resultant force. That's acting to the right. The mass is given there, it's 50 kilograms. So to work out the acceleration, I need to use this equation, but again, we need to be able to rearrange. Remember, the one you want stays where it is. We're gonna move the other one, which is mass this time. It goes to the other side, but it goes underneath the F. So the equation will be A equals F divided by M. The force is 100 newtons. The mass is 50 kilograms. And so our final answer is 100 divided by 50, which is two. The units can either be newtons per kilogram, but I'm just gonna use the common units for acceleration, which we know are meters per second squared. This question's asking us to calculate the mass of the block. I've got two forces. I should be able to get the resultant force. It tells us that the block is gonna accelerate at three meters per second squared. And I'm going to use this equation. Have a go yourself. Okay, so the resultant force is 160 minus 10. So that's 150 newtons to the right. The acceleration, we're told, is 3 meters per second squared. 
and mass is the thing we're trying to calculate. Can you rearrange equations yet? Let's see. What would m equal? Well, the a is the one we're going to move, and because they're multiplied together, that means that when the a goes on the other side, it goes underneath the f. Force is 150, acceleration is 3, therefore the mass of the block must be 50 kilograms. Question 14. We've been given some information here. Um, this is actually more, I've put this in because I think this is a little bit of a sticking point with a lot of students. We find it difficult to distinguish the difference between what balanced forces are and what paired forces are. Now, let's have a look at this example. A wheel pushes back on the ground with 150 newtons. So as a wheel tries to turn, it tries to push the ground back. This happens in real life, and you can tell because if you ever watch a rally race, when the wheels spin, they actually push the dirt or the stones back. Um, now, the, the, the equal and opposite effect to that, which is Newton's third law, states that there must be a force that is created because of the first force pushing on something. So if a wheel pushes back on the ground with 150 newtons, then it means that the ground must be pushing the wheel forwards with 150 newtons. So the wheel pushes back on the ground. The force that's created is the ground pushing the wheel forwards. We call this a reaction force because it only happens and only gets created um, as a reaction to the first force. Now this is different to when a wheel is being pushed forwards to a, with 150 newtons and friction pushes back on the wheel with 150 newtons. I'm going to put these two forces on. So we're saying that the wheel is being pushed forwards with 150 newtons. So that's like from the engine on the drive shaft, it's trying to turn the wheel, it's pushing it forwards with 150 newtons. But friction, so the friction acting on the tyre is actually 150 newtons as well. In this example, the wheel is being pushed forwards with 150, friction pushes back on the wheel. So it's on the wheel, the wheel is being pushed. Both of these forces act on the wheel. Now if both of the forces are acting on one object, then that is a balanced force. Those 150 newtons are actually going to cancel each other out. And this is what tends to happen you know, at top speed of a car when it can't actually get any faster because all the forces are being balanced. However, this situation, the wheel is being pushed back, sorry, I got that wrong. A wheel pushes back on the ground. So the first 150 newtons is actually acting on the ground. A wheel pushes back on the ground. Whilst the ground pushes the wheel forwards, so that one's acting on the wheel. We can see in this example, the force acting backwards is acting on the ground, the force acting forwards is on the wheel. This is a reaction when they're causing equal and opposite forces to act on the two different objects. That's Newton's third law. However, here, the two forces that we're talking about, or given in the example or in the question, they're saying that both of these forces are acting on just the wheel. And that means that if they're the same size in opposite directions, that this is a balanced force diagram. So balanced forces for 
this one, yet this one is a pair of action reaction forces or an action reaction pair we sometimes call it. Let's try and apply it in a question. The ball pushes down on the table with 10 newtons. That means that the table, can you finish that sentence? Well, if the ball pushes down on the table, that means that the table pushes up on the ball. Now is that an example of balanced forces or is it an example of an action-reaction pair? Well, think about what the forces are acting on. The ball pushes down on the table. So the first one is the table is getting pushed down because the ball is pushing it down. Whilst the second one, the table pushes up on the ball. Oh, well that's actually acting on the ball, not the table. So we've got a force of 10 newtons down on the table and we've got a force of 10 newtons acting up on the ball. If these were the only two forces, then what should technically happen? Have a think. If these were the only two forces acting on the ball and the table, what should we see happen? Well, just think about the ball on its own. If an object has a resultant force of 10 newtons up, then that means that the ball must accelerate in the upwards direction. So it would just go flying into the air. The table, if there's just a force acting down on it, then that means that the table would have to accelerate downwards. Now if you try this for yourself, you'll probably find that the table doesn't fly downwards and the ball doesn't fly up. So why is that? Well, now we have to look at the objects individually and think about balanced forces. Although there is a 10 newtons force acting up on the ball, on Earth we also know that there is a weight force. And the weight force is pulling down on the ball. If we see that the ball is not accelerating, then it must mean that the weight of the ball is 10 newtons. Those two forces are balanced, and so the ball stays where it is on the table. The table, we said there's 10 newtons pushing down. Now, the ball's pushing the table down with 10 newtons, so the table should be accelerating that way, but it doesn't. Why not? There must be another force balancing it. And what we'll find is that it's the floor reacting to the push of the table. Each leg, this is because my table has two legs. Um, if we did a 3D diagram, we could maybe say there'd be two and a half newtons per leg. But just for the sake of ease, all we need to know is that there must be 10 newtons acting up. And so if you've got a five newton acting up and another five newton acting up, then that's a total force of 10 newtons acting up. The, the table's being pushed down 10 newtons by the ball. And we can see that they act in opposite directions. They cancel out. There's no acceleration because the resultant force comes to zero. Now, I've tried to be as clear as possible with this, but these two things are um, probably one of the most confused sections of, um, well, probably of paper five, the entire paper five. The idea of action reaction, one thing pushes on another thing and therefore the other thing pushes back. Or is it just one object that has two or even more forces act on it, which can be balanced? Once you've established how many forces are acting on one object, like this when we split it up, then you can start to think about is the object going to speed up or is it going to um, stay where it is or even slow down. So as a little extension, let's think about what if the table broke? What if it just decided to break? Well, in this diagram, the 10 newtons acting down is the weight of the ball. If the table broke, then the table wouldn't be there to push up on the ball. 
and so the ball would accelerate down. In other words, if the table broke, you'd, accept, you'd expect the ball to fall down as well.